So we've been finding exoplanets for a while now, but with new more powerful telescopes like the James Webb Telescope, which is finally in place out there, and the upcoming Extremely Large Telescope, cleverly named, uh, we might actually be able to visually see Earth-like exoplanets for the first time. So imagine we find one that's 70% water on its surface, with just some small disconnected land masses thrown about. We would call that a water planet, and we would imagine that it was a world dominated by water cycles. This is, of course, exactly the situation here on Earth. We may not feel like our lives are dominated by water, we may not think about it very often, depending on where you live, but even if you live nowhere near a coast, you live on a planet whose climate and conditions are controlled by water. This planet is a chaotic, swirling maelstrom of fluid dynamics, both in the air and in the ocean, whose fluctuations hold sway over us in ways that we're still trying to comprehend. One of the best examples of that is the Atlantic Gulf Stream. It's underwater, it's invisible, most of us don't even know it's there, but it is there. And it would be a very different planet without it. In one of my recent lightning round videos, I was asked about the Gulf Stream and what would happen if it collapsed. And it generated a lot of conversation, so here we are. So when I say in a lightning round video that if you like a topic, I might do a deeper dive on it, well, I'm not a liar, am I? But it's worth a deeper dive because the Gulf Stream is actually pretty fascinating. Like, we just assume that the further north you go, the colder it gets. Makes sense, it's colder at the poles. But the Gulf Stream kind of proves that's not always true. For example, London is further north than Calgary. But while Calgary's average December temperature is negative 6 degrees Celsius, London's is 7 degrees Celsius. That's warmer. Is London sitting on top of a geological hotspot that keeps it warm? Is it a higher elevation so it's closer to the sun? Did British colonialism import Celsiuses from India and Africa? <laughs> no, silly. It's the invisible river of hot water under the ocean bathed in the scepter isles in divine warmth. Duh. Except that's, um... That's exactly what it is. The Gulf Stream is a warm ocean current located in the western North Atlantic Ocean that brings warm water from the Gulf of Mexico up through the North Atlantic to the Norwegian Sea in Western Europe. It travels north along Florida's coast and then turns toward the east off North Carolina where it continues to flow northeast across the Atlantic, giving Western Europe those extra Celsiuses. Then it cools and travels back down south where it gets reheated and through a combination of trade winds and the Earth's motion, moves back across to the Caribbean and starts all over again with other tributaries splitting off and joining other worldwide currents. A few crazy facts about the Gulf Stream. First of all, it moves almost 4 billion cubic feet of water per second. This is more than all the world's rivers combined. In fact, off the U.S. Atlantic seaboard, the stream flows almost 300 times faster than the Amazon River. And as it widens to the north, it slows down to about 1.6 kilometers an hour. And then once it reaches Europe, it adds as much heat as a million nuclear reactors. But like, how? Like, how does it just keep repeating over and over again throughout all the millennia? Like, isn't that... Isn't that like perpetual motion? So actually, no, it's, it's not perpetual motion. Perpetual motion would mean that there's no energy entering the system, but there is energy entering the system, the sun. The Gulf Stream is powered by differences in two things, temperature and salinity, salinity being the salt content of the water. And as the sun heats the ocean water, it does two things. One, it becomes less dense because of the heat, and two, it evaporates, increasing the salinity. Hence, the Gulf Stream is called a thermohaline circulation. Thermo for temperature, haline for salt content. And this takes place all around the world. There's a global ocean conveyor belt constantly moving mass and energy around the planet, and the Gulf Stream is just a part of that. It's actually part of a larger system called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, which covers the North and South Atlantic. And in that system is what they call a subtropical gyre circulation. This is where the Gulf Stream is. It's kind of a current section, if you will. Now, it needs to be said that this particular gyre is not completely driven by thermohaline forces. It's mostly wind-driven. Uh, the thermohaline bit only contributes about 20% to the Gulf Stream's flow. But what it does with that 20% is pretty amazing. This is Toluga Falls in South Africa. At 983 meters, it's the tallest waterfall in the world, though it's not quite as well known as Angel Falls in Venezuela that's a few meters shorter at 979 meters. But these pale in comparison to the actual largest waterfall in the world, the Denmark Strait Cataracts, located here between Iceland and Greenland, nowhere near Denmark, and right in the middle of the ocean. Yes, it is an underwater waterfall and it's part of the AMOC. And if you're wondering how there could possibly be waterfalls in the ocean, here's how. The south-flowing cold water from the Nordic Sea meets the warm water from the Erminger Sea. And when these two water masses collide, the cold water sinks below the warm water because cold water is more dense. And this water plunges down over a massive underwater cliff falling 3,505 meters, more than three times further than Angel Falls. It's also by far the most massive waterfall in the world, flowing more than 123 million cubic feet per second. But because this happens in the middle of the ocean, most people don't know about it. 
In fact, you wouldn't even know it was there unless you were measuring it with scientific instruments. Which is kind of indicative of the entire AMOX system because you don't even know it's there, but it's huge and it makes a massive impact on the world. It's thought that without this circulation, a few things could happen. The Arctic ice would expand for one thing. Northern and Western Europe could be much colder. The intertropical convergence zone could shift southward and the sea level along North America's east coast could be higher. And researchers suggested that a shutdown of the AMOC could affect temperatures all across the US. According to a study published in Communications Earth and Environment, quote, extreme cold weather intensifies disproportionately compared to the mean climate response after the shutdown of the overturning circulation. Our results suggest that an active overturning circulation in the present day climate likely makes the US winter much less harsh and extreme. Which is really interesting. And by interesting, I mean terrifying. Because it's slowing down. Kind of a lot. In fact, a study from last year showed that the AMOC is the weakest it's been in over a thousand years. Oh, uh, here comes the doom and gloom. The researchers looked at 11 indicators like ocean temperature patterns and deep sea sediments going back to around 400 CE. And they found that nine of those 11 indicators showed a consistent pattern of weakening. According to the co-author of the study, quote, the study suggests that the AMOC has been relatively stable until the late 19th century. With the end of the Little Ice Age in about 1850, the ocean currents began to decline. Okay, so that's important to remember. There was a little ice age in the late 1700s to mid 1800s where temperatures, you know, kind of dropped in the Northern Hemisphere. And this is saying that it's that natural warming that's caused the AMOC to weaken. So there you go. See, for once, <laughs> for once it's not climate change. Thank God. All right, the quote goes on. With a second, more drastic decline following since the mid 20th century. So here's what's going on. So rising global temperatures in the Arctic does a couple of things. First of all, it increases rainfall in the area and it accelerates the melting of the ice sheets, like the Greenland ice sheet. Both of these things push more fresh water into the ocean, which reduces the salinity of the water. Remember, this is a thermohaline current and this less salty water is less dense. This less dense water then sinks slower in that underwater waterfall that I was talking about earlier and that slows down the entire Gulf Stream, which is why it's weaker now than it's been in a thousand years. Weakening is one thing. It would be a totally different thing if the entire system were to say divert itself. And with all this ice melting in the Arctic, that might happen? Kind of, sort of, not really, but maybe? Like for hundreds of years, navigators and seafarers were searching for a Northwest Passage. And no, that is not named after Kim and Kanye's daughter. Now, European traders were trying to find a better way to get to Asia because the spice must flow. But they either had to go all the way around Africa or all the way around South America, which is why they wanted a canal across Panama so badly. But another option was to go over the top, find a passage through the land masses north of Canada. The only problem is that it's the frickin' Arctic and those lanes were all clogged with ice. And this turned a lot of sailors into popsicles. With all this ice melting in the last few decades, some routes are actually starting to open up. On August 21st, 2007, the Northwest Passage became open to ships without the need for an icebreaker for the first time. And in 2009, the Beluga Group out of Germany became the first commercial shipping company to ship goods through the Northwest Passage. It's actually thought that as this ice melts, some tiny outposts along this route in Canada and Alaska might become super important shipping hubs in the coming decades. But as this ice melts, what are the odds that the AMOC kind of splits off and changes direction? And what would that do? What if this super important global current just changes course? For the record, nobody is suggesting that this will happen. Um, but it has happened before. I mentioned the Isthmus of Panama a second ago and how frustrating that must have been to European traders. Well, if they were there a few million years earlier, this wouldn't have been a problem because North and South America didn't connect back then. Yeah, there was a gap between the continents of North and South America for millions of years and ocean currents flowed through that gap. And then about 2.8 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama formed and it basically rerouted all the currents in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Atlantic's currents were forced northward and settled into a new pattern that today we now call the Gulf Stream. And this dramatically changed climate and weather patterns all around the world. Actually, according to NASA's Earth Observatory, the formation of the Isthmus of Panama is one of the most important geological events that have happened in the last 60 million years. So if that most important thing were to change, what does that mean? So there's several potential scenarios if the AMOC were to slow down or collapse. For one, colder temperatures in Northern Europe. And that heat that normally goes to Northern Europe would then stay along the east coast of the US, which would also experience higher sea levels. According to Brenda Aquerzel of the Union of Concerned Scientists, quote, if you slow down the sinking of water in the North Atlantic, that means you have a pileup of waters along the eastern seaboard of the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. That means that you have increased regional sea level rise from the ocean circulation change. So that's not good for New York City, Norfolk, or along Florida. And when we say colder temperatures in Northern Europe, um, it's good to know that the last time there was a disturbance in deep water circulation about 12,000 years ago, 
Europe became a tundra. And yet some scientists think that this could happen again if the Gulf Stream collapsed, bringing forth another ice age or at least a small one. It would cause global weather disruption, including more powerful storms in the Northern Hemisphere and disruption of rain patterns in Africa, India, and South America, which would affect crops in all those areas. And last, but kind of least, <laughs> it would also impact migration patterns from marine life and may impact the fishing industry. But before you panic too much, there are some that think that it wouldn't actually be that bad. Richard Seeger is a research professor from Columbia University, and in 2002, he and his colleagues published a study that suggested that this connection between the Gulf Stream and European climate is really more of a myth. They suggest it has a lot more to do with the jet stream. According to the paper, when the jet stream, which is obviously in the atmosphere, when it hits the Rocky Mountains, it starts to oscillate north and south, producing wind flows that travel in those directions, one north and one south. The north flow brings cold air to the northeastern US, and the southern flow swings across the Caribbean and brings warm air to northwestern Europe. So yeah, if this is true, then the collapse of the Gulf Stream would only produce a mild cooling effect. Or according to Seeger, quote, this would leave the temperature contrast across the Atlantic unchanged and not plunge Europe back into the Ice Age or anything like it. In fact, the cooling tendency would probably be overwhelmed by the direct radiatively driven warming by rising greenhouse gases. In other words, we probably wouldn't even notice it. Now it needs to be said, this is not the consensus view, but it is an interesting theory. Regardless, the Gulf Stream and the global system of currents that it's a part of is an awesome force of nature that not only moves water all around the world, but the energy carried in that water as well. And it is weakening and could shift weather patterns over time. A total collapse is probably an extreme outcome. So after researching this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall on the side of that it's maybe not quite the doomsday scenario that it's chalked up to be. Now we do still need to be doing all the things to lower global temperatures and prevent the ice cap from melting. This doesn't change that. I'm just saying that of all the effects of climate change that we have to worry about, um, there's probably some others that are of a more immediate concern. Feel free to disagree in the comments. But, you know, be nice. There's enough stress in the world right now. And if you want to stress less about food, then maybe you should check out today's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a subscription food service that brings chef-prepared meals straight to your door with some assembly required. But that's actually the best part. My wife and I have been cooking HelloFresh for years now, and, and we love it. We put on music, we pour some wine, uh, and we make this food that's better than anything I ever thought I could make. Because the recipes are from professional chefs, and they're easy to do. Just follow the directions. No special skills or kitchen items necessary. They have several different options, from family-friendly, fit and wholesome, pescatarian, and veggie options to choose from. And the ingredients are all sourced direct from farmers, and they send you the exact amounts you need, which both lowers the price compared to grocery shopping, and it also cuts down on food waste. And if you're concerned about packaging waste, you should know they use already recycled materials. And if you sign up at HelloFresh.com and use my code JOESCOTT16, you'll get 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. What are the gifts, Joe? Well, I don't know. It's a surprise. By the way, I usually get two meals out of each one of these whenever I make them, so this is a crazy amount of free food. So unless you just don't want free food, give it a try. It's definitely worth it. It's at HelloFresh.com, promo code JOESCOTT16, links down below. Big thanks to HelloFresh for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are supporting this channel, forming an awesome community, and just doing all kinds of cool things. I got some new names to murder real quick. We've got uh, Pruncius Pilot, Mary Jo LaRue, Tracy Johnson, Curtis Nash, Howard Kraut, Daniel McGrath, The Simulation Has You, <laughs> Joe Scott's Beautiful Hairline, uh, Moxie, Stop Suicide Dawn, uh, Michelle P, May Danger, Stephanie Bramer, Sarah Seymour, Jeff Alexander, Nicholas, Leslie Shaw, DRB Banner, Bingo Ruby, Alex Carbone, uh, Edward Thompson, Matthew Cameron, doing this with my hands helps for some reason, uh, Jerry Mendez, Kylie Williams, RTH, and Chase E. There you go. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos and get access to exclusive live streams and other cool stuff, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, you might want to check this one out because Google thinks you'll like that one or any of the others that might come up in your recommended feed that have my little face on them. Uh, definitely go take a look. And if you like them and you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I'll come back every Monday. And that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, especially if you're in Ukraine. And I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.